Five stocks to buy for 2024. That's what we're going to get into in today's video, folks. I thought about the five strongest stocks I could possibly imagine going into 2024, the ones that have the most attractive valuations as well with lots of potential upside here. And I thought, uh, let's go ahead and talk about these five stocks. Let's go in depth on all five of these stocks. And um, let me share my perspective. Now, there's one of four scenarios that could play out for the economy, kind of the overall market in 2024. And in today's video, I thought about what companies would do great even in that sort of scenario, all these different scenarios, right? Which scenarios one is where earnings went down, recession hits, job losses, revenues went down, right? The Fed starts cutting rates in the second half of 2024. That's a scenario that could play out. Scenario two is economy weakens, but we don't have a recession. Jobs hold up. Inflation's in the threes and fours all year, and the Fed basically keeps rates about where they're at right now. Another scenario that could play out for us in 2024 is the economy gets stronger, unemployment stays in the threes, real wages boom, housing bottoms in the winter time, home prices start to climb in the second half of 2024, the economy is seen as too hot and the Fed has to keep raising rates actually and starts raising rates again in 2024. And then the last scenario to, that could potentially play out here is the economy holds good, unemployment stays, let's call it in the 3% type range, real wages recover, housing and auto, autos bottom maybe in the first quarter, CPI in the twos and threes all year. The uh, Fed, let's just call it, um, you know, keeps rates about where they're at. Maybe they lower rates just a little bit, and uh, the market just booms into 2024 and into election 2024. So those are the, you know, those are the four scenarios that could play out for us in 2024. And so um, these stocks I'm sharing with you here today, I believe they're going to do well regardless of any of those scenarios, folks. So appreciate you joining me. Hope you enjoyed today's video, and uh, I'm proud to present the Black Friday deal for the first time ever. Yes, uh, the Black Friday deal this year. I wanted to do something that was affordable to literally everybody this year. Every year I do a Black Friday deal for something. And so uh, what we're going to do this year is I have a $125 Patreon tier. We're going to do it for only 62 bucks. And in that tier, you get access to my Becoming Master Stock Market course, the ability to see what stocks I'm buying and selling each week. And you get to see exactly how I diversify my funds around, exactly how I build a portfolio through Fidelity Investments. So that deal will be Black Friday only. If you want access to that deal when it drops, then uh, enter in info, basically pin comment down there. You can enter your info and we'll send you over the deal right when it drops on Black Friday. It will be a one day, one day only sale. And uh, that will be that. So like I said, I want to do something that whether you got a thousand bucks in your portfolio, whether you got a million dollars in your portfolio, like, you know, everybody could get access to that and learn and, and all those sorts of things. Alrighty guys, let's get into this. First stock up here of the five stocks is Elf Beauty. Elf Beauty, a uh, tremendous company, one of the strongest companies literally in the stock market. They've been through everything. They went through tariffs, they went through trade war, they went through Rona, they, 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 they went through the NASDAQ drop of 35% plus last year. They went through a super high inflationary environment. They've gone through it all. And regardless of the scenario they are thrown into, they grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And there's very few companies that can truly say that. Now, I will say of the stocks I owned over the past five years, Elf is the best company. Elf is the best company. They are the most well-run company I've really seen. And I own a lot of great companies. I own Meta, I own Tesla, I own a lot of great companies. But no one takes the cake over Elf, which also explains the share price gain. I've made 1,200% plus on the stock over the last several years. And I think we're just getting started. I think we've got a long runway of growth ahead here in Elf. Okay. Now, some signs of a great company is a company that can continually beat earnings expectations quarter in and quarter out on the revenue side and on the earnings per share side. And this is very substantial. And if we look at Elf, quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter, you're not going to find a more high quality company than an Elf Beauty. Not. There's no companies out there that are beating this substantially quarter in and quarter out for the last several years. It's incredible. Some companies can beat a little bit here, a little bit there. These beats are epic on the earnings per share side. The elf comes in at. It's shocking, borderline shocking. Now, the other beautiful thing about a company that continually beats analyst expectations quarter in and quarter out for revenue and for earnings per share is the company's basically always trading much cheaper than what you think you're paying for. And that's beautiful because you might think you're paying, you know, you could have thought you were paying a 50 forward PE last year for the stock, for instance, right? 
really you were paying a way lower forward P than that because the company beat analyst expectations quarter in and quarter out over the past year. It's beautiful, okay? Now, if we look at a poor quality stock like a Dollar General, for instance, right, this is a sign of a poor quality company. They miss earnings per share, miss earnings per share, miss earnings per share, try to just come in and meet. And then if they beat earnings per share, it's like little teeny beats as a percentage basis, right? It missed on revenue, missed on revenue, missed on revenue, missed on revenue. And what does that do for a stock price? It kills it. Uh, that's why Dollar General stock is down 52% in the past year, right? It's lost all its gains from the past five years because their performance has been so bad, right? And so if you're wondering, what does Wall Street look at? What do investors like? They like companies that they know when that company reports earnings, they're likely coming in with beats. That makes investors feel comfortable, sleep well at night, and people will pay premium prices for companies that they feel comfortable with. No one wants to be in a company that is continually missing earnings. People want to be in these sorts of companies that are beating quarter in and quarter out. That's where you feel comfortable putting your money, right? It's your hard-earned money at the end of the day. Now, you might say, well, how does this company even make any damn money? Their products are so cheap. I mean, look at the price points. It's shocking. Look at this. $10, $5, $4, $6, $6, $3, $9.99. Heck, you get six products here for less than 20 bucks. Are you kidding me? Five bucks, 10 bucks, six bucks, seven bucks, right? And you might say, there's no way this company makes good margins. There's no way selling products at this cheap price, uh, get ready to have your flapjacks flipped. Look at the gross margins. One of the highest gross margins you will ever find for a physical product company. I mean, these are practically digital product companies type sales, <laughs> type gross margins. I mean, this is ridiculous. Gross margin for their latest quarter was up 570 basis points, which is just a fancy way of saying 5.7%, to 71%. That's crazy. I mean, it's almost impossible to find companies that sell physical products that have gross margins of 70 plus percent. That's almost unheard of. It is insane, okay? Now, you might say, well, do people like their product? Yes, people love their product. Brand satisfaction is always super high. This company, friends tell friends, this person tells that person, they talk about it on social media. The brand satisfaction is over the top and that's why people just continue to buy the product again and again and again, which is super important in the makeup industry because it's basically a consumable, right? Uh, you know, you use your makeup or you use your, your uh, you know, skincare products and then you gotta go buy it again and buy it again. And so you have a recurring revenue stream there for years or potentially decades. Like if somebody starts using e.l.f. as a teenager, let's say for instance, right? And they have a great experience with that. They're still going to use it in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s, so on and so forth, right? As long as that product continues to meet the quality that they're expecting. Now, if we look at their latest quarter, for instance, 76% sales growth. <laughs> It's insane. 570 basis points of gross margin increase. And by the way, 76% net sales growth. And this is why almost you listen to how many companies, I, if we look at like the past quarter or two, the most companies ever are talking about soft demand, slow demand. Um, you know, it's a tough environment out there to operate. And Elf's like 76% revenue growth. Eat our dust, okay? Incredible, incredible gross margin. Adjusted EBITDA was up 122%. And look at this right here in front of you, 19 consecutive quarters of net sales growth. And the most shocking thing about this is folks, even as a shareholder's company, I've thought many times like, oh, this must be the top for their growth. Like they can't grow faster than this. I thought that even right here, when they grew revenue 16%, I was like, that's probably the top. And then they grew revenue 24%. And I was like, that's probably the top. Then they grew revenue 50%. I was like, they're probably never touching a number like that again. Then they grew revenue 49%. I was like, what? Then they grew revenue 78%. I was like, what? They can never grow at those sorts of rates again. And then they came through with a 76% growth rate. And then another quarter 76% growth rate. And I'm like, what? This is what you call a company that is on a whole other level. When they consistently beat your expectations quarter in, quarter out. And you're just left there just shaking your head like, how are they doing this? This is incredible. Okay. Now, this is extremely important. Listen. Elf is one of 800 cosmetics brands or so, okay? It is a sea of cosmetics brands everywhere, right? And yet this company just continues to eat market share. 19 quarters of share gains, right? They just continue to take market share. This is the outlier company, okay? It's no different than there's a lot of people that play soccer. They're not messy. 
There's a lot of people that play football and quarterback, and they're not Tom Brady. And there's a lot of people that play basketball, and they're not Steph Curry, okay? There's what we call outliers in sports. There's what we call outlier companies, where there's a lot of people that try to do the same thing, but there's just certain ones that are just so much better than everybody else that everybody's like, damn, man, how the hell do they do it? I really don't understand. Like, how the hell do they do it? And that is Elf. Elf is the Messi of makeup. They are the Brady of makeup. They are the Steph Curry of makeup, the Michael Jordan, whatever you want to call it. They're on a whole different level. Now, the beautiful thing is international sales is really just starting to come along for the company. 157% international sales growth. And keep in mind, the international market long term should be far bigger, and I mean far bigger than the U.S. market, because their products are so affordable, and they do so well on social media, like, and obviously there's a lot more people that live outside the United States of America than live inside the United States of America, so their international business should dwarf, I mean completely dwarf their U.S. business over time, okay? Look at this, in Canada, they're 10xing the category. In the United Kingdom, there's seven Xing the category. These are extraordinary numbers, okay? This company's on a whole different level. No, how do they do this? They do it through a lot of different ways. Some is with their brand packaging, the, some is with their price points, their quality. Another way is on social media. This company understands social media going viral better than certainly any company in the makeup industry, maybe any company in the world, to be quite frank, okay? Look at this. They do these like collabs with different companies, okay? Like they did this one with Chipotle, got over 4 billion impressions. They did this one here, this collab with Dunkin' Donuts, over 5 billion impressions. They did this one with, what is it, American Eagle Jeans or whatever, 7 billion plus impressions. They did this one with this Dirty Pillows company, 11 billion plus impressions. That sold out in less than two hours. They sold out in less than two hours, folks, okay? And f around 40% of the people that bought were, were new customers, like new purchasers for Elf. I mean, they understand going viral on a whole different level. They understand social media on a whole different level. Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, the whole game, okay? Now, with their products, they're coming in at price points that are so much lower than like the prestige categories, but people say that the quality is, is pretty much on par with the prestige quality. So they'll sell a product for $10 when the other name brands are selling it for $54. They'll sell a product at $7 versus other name brands are selling it for $31 or sell a product for $10 when the other name brands are selling it for $38, right? That's the beautiful thing. When you come in with that great quality and it's at a price point that literally everybody can afford, everybody can afford those price points, okay? Now, this is the other huge component of Elf's growth right now and over the coming years is shelf space. This is very important. Okay, very important. They're growing massively in Target. They're also growing massively in Walmart. They just, back in the springtime, they had new, um, let's call it increases in shelf space. They also just, in the fall time right now, they got Ulta Beauty space expansion, CVS and Walgreens as well. They got more coming in the spring. And, and I don't see there being any time soon when they stop growing shelf space because when I look, I'm looking and I'm saying like they're the most dominant makeup company out there right now. Like the numbers they're putting up, the growth they're putting up. Like if you're a retailer, you want to have more and more space. Like they're over indexing in a massive, massive way. Check this out. I posted this inside my private stock group inside the Elf uh, chat here, okay? And uh, I, I needed to go to Walgreens for something, and then I walked by the, the beauty section, and, and I just looked, and I'm like, whoa, look at that Elf section there. And it's, it's amazing, because I remember when I was first investing in this company, like, my local Walgreens didn't even carry Elf. They didn't even carry Elf back in those days. And to now see that big of an Elf section for Walgreens is just absolutely phenomenal, right? And they're just going to continue to gobble up market share, right? Now, if we look at their income statement, this is, this is as good as it gets, folks, in the, in the public markets. This is an A-plus income statement, okay? 215, this is their quarter they just reported in the last week or two. Net sales, $215 million versus $122 million in the same quarter last year. Cost of sales went up hardly anything compared to their, their net sales increase. Went to $63 million versus $42 million. That means their gross profit's going to explode, right? Their gross profit went to $152 million versus $79 million in the same quarter last year. Selling general administrative expenses went up substantially for the company, as you would expect, considering they're expanding so rapidly and including around the world, right? 
Despite uh, selling general administrative expenses being up substantially for the company, operating income still went to over $40 million. This versus $15 million operating income in the same quarter last year. Net income nearly 3 x for the company to $33 million from $11 million in the same quarter last year, right? And their earnings per share nearly 3 x as well. That's an A-plus income statement. It doesn't get better than that. That is absolutely shockingly phenomenal. On top of that, their balance sheet is phenomenal as well. Cash and cash equivalents, $167 million. Total, total assets of $746 million versus total liabilities of $230 million. Yeah, baby. That's a balance sheet there, okay? That's a balance sheet. Now, let's talk about the one elephant in the room, okay? The one elephant in the room is valuation, Somebody could look at this stock, and if they're not, let's just call it very educated, they could say, you know what? This stock is trading expensive. It's overvalued. Is it? Here's the deal. We're trading at about 37 times uh, forward P for this year's numbers expected, okay? 37 times. Now, that's about 2x what the market trades at. Your market's usually in the kind of the 15 to 20 range, roughly. So let's call it 2x-ish the market, right? Now, one thing is, what do we know about ELF? They beat numbers like every freaking quarter. So there's very high probability that this 265 that analysts are expecting for EPS for this year, is there's a very high probability it's too low considering ELF beats quarter in, quarter out, right? That's the first thing we got to consider. So maybe that's a lot lower number. The second component is, right, ELF is growing revenue a 70 plus percent clip. They've done it three straight quarters, right? The average stock in the market is growing revenue, you know, well under 7%, let's say, for instance. So ELF has 10x, at least 10x, the type of growth of the average stock in the stock market. But yet it has roughly 2x the valuation of the average stock in the stock market. That means huge, huge arbitrage. And I mean massive arbitrage in regards to ELF Beauty here, folks. So when I look at ELF Beauty, I look out there and I bring it back to the four scenarios that could play out next year, Right. And it doesn't matter whether inflation's high, whether inflation's not high, whether we have a recession, whether we don't have a recession, it doesn't matter. ELF's going to put up phenomenal numbers regardless of the economic environment. Regardless, they're going to put up extraordinary numbers. The Fed can lower interest rates, raise interest rates, keep interest rates the same in 24. It's all irrelevant to them. And there's very few companies that you can say that because I can tell you there's a lot of companies out there that are very negatively affected, including even a company I own like Tesla, right? Very negatively affected by the interest rate environment we have right now, right? But I can tell you for an elf beauty, it's all irrelevant. They're going to put up phenomenal numbers next year, the year after the year after, regardless of what goes on in the economy, regardless of recessions, no recessions, great economy, bad economy, okay economy, consumer confidence high, consumer confidence low, it's all irrelevant. They're, com- they're just competing at a different level. They're the Messi, they're the, they're the Brady, they're the Steph Curry, okay? And so I absolutely love Elf Beauty. I obviously own my shares. I want to continue to hold my shares. I even bought more shares recently. I bought more shares recently, which is a tough decision for me to make. I can tell you that. To buy more shares of Elf, a stock you're already up, 1,200% or whatever, to buy more shares shows my conviction in the stock for 2024 and the years beyond. And they honestly deserve my money. Sometimes the market, you got to ask, who deserves your money? Who deserves your money? Damn, I got to say, Elf deserves my freaking money, okay? All right, you guys, that's the first one of these five stocks. That's a easy money, great buy for 2024. Next one up here of these stocks to buy for 2024 is... Meta, 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 meta. First thing I want to address, okay, in regards to meta, it's had a tremendous year, 146% gain. Honestly, guys, it's irrelevant. The the stock got absolutely decimated last year. And so what this year was is just getting back to where meta used to be at a $300-ish type stock, okay? Don't even think the stock price is high. And we're going to go through the valuation metrics here. This stock is actually extremely low right now, okay? Now, the next stop for Meta stock is six hundred dollars a share, six hundred, and it's headed there, folks. Um, so I am up three hundred sixty thousand dollars in the stock right now. I'm going to be up a whole lot more. Like this is going to be a million dollar plus position in the public account without me ever adding another share to the stock over time. All right, here's what we have going on in Meta's latest numbers. Which remember, all these companies, we have record amount of companies talking about you know demands weak and you know all this stuff. And yet, what does Meta put up for a quarter? Twenty three percent revenue growth, 
Meanwhile, they dropped cost and expenses by 7%. When you can grow your revenue like that and you drop your expenses, your income from operations is going to blast to the moon, okay? And that's exactly what happened with Meta. Their income from operations was up 143% to $13.7 billion in the quarter, okay? Their net income grew a shocking 164% year over year to $11.5 billion, and their diluted earnings per share grew 168%. Meanwhile, their family daily active people, this means somebody's using at least one of their apps on a daily basis, which they obviously own Facebook, Facebook Marketplace, they obviously own Instagram, they own Facebook Messenger, and then they own WhatsApp as well, right? And so 3.14 billion people are using at least one of those apps on a daily basis. Family monthly active people, so this is somebody using at least one of those apps on a monthly basis, is nearly $4 billion now, $3.96 billion. Don't be surprised if that crosses $4 billion in this upcoming quarter. They have cash loads on this company, $62 billion roughly in cash and marketable securities. Now, here's a deal. The stock's trading so undervalued. Based upon what analysts have next year's numbers being, which by the way, Meta is getting back to beating numbers again, so don't be surprised if these numbers are too low, analysts have. Don't be surprised if they do like $20 at EPS next year. But based upon analyst numbers, they have this stock at about an 18.5 forward PE. Now, this is a company that just grew revenues 26, 23%, and they're growing their, their bottom line by over 150%, right? So that's far outstripping the market. Why should it be trading anywhere near where market multiples trade at. It doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense, okay? They're so far outgrowing the average stock in the market, it's not even funny. This stock right now should have a forward P of about 33 to, I would say, about 37 on it right now. 33 to 37 would be very fair considering this company's growth rates and prospects over time, okay? Now, on top of that, if that wasn't enough, we got other great news here. Great, 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 okay? Oculus 3, MetaQuest 3, whatever you want to call it, okay? Uh, this device, I, I got, my, mine came uh, a few weeks ago and I've gotten to experiment with this. It's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. It is clear as day. Meta is the leader in the world when it comes to VR and AR, and it's really not even close. They're so far the leader, it's not even funny. Whenever Apple finally gets to the space, they should be the number two, but a Apple's still not even in the space yet. You know, they're supposed to sell their nearly $4,000 device at some point next year. Good luck selling that. Uh, but the bottom line is Meta is clear as day, the leader in the space. They have these crazy games now on, on the, the Meta Quest 3. I mean, check this out. You basically can turn your house into like a virtual like war zone type situation. It is insane. The pass-through technology, like what they got going on there, and for 500 bucks, it's like, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm literally shocked that they could have that sort of technology in a device for 500 bucks. It is insane. So they're going to reach scale much faster than anybody else in the space, and they're going to win the category. You got a lot of videos starting to go viral of people doing things with the new Quest 3 on. Like somebody did their laundry, literally while they were watching a movie and watching shows and stuff like that because the pass-through technology is so phenomenal. And just a lot of videos going viral out there on social media. So, I mean, yeah, VR and AR space is going to be massive over this next 5 to 10 years. We're still kind of like, I think we're at maybe the second inning. I'd call it the second inning of VR and AR right now. The first inning was kind of the first few devices these companies created. I think uh, we're, we just entered the second inning of this game and it's a long game to go, okay? So when it comes to meta, revenue growth, big revenue growth, 20% plus, huge net income growth, what, you know, 150% plus-ish, uh, A plus balance sheet, yes, one of the best balance sheets in the world, proven products, dang right, at WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, and now they got the, you know, the, the Quest products. I mean, oh my gosh. Proven management team that's been through it 100%. Attractive valuation, yes. Easy money stock, yes. Absolutely. And Zuckerberg, the best thing with Zuckerberg is he definitely wants to keep Meta lean and a mean machine, which he, the, the interesting thing is not just about bringing down cost. And I think this is important. Everybody understands this last point in regards to Meta. It's not just about bringing down costs and spending less money and making your profitability go higher. It's about moving faster. If you have a more efficient team, you're not as bureaucratic. You can make moves faster. You can say, let's go over here. Let's do this. Let's do that. You have a bogged down corporation, very bureaucratic, too many employees. Everything starts moving slower. Your innovation pace starts moving slower and slower and slower. Now, Meta can just come out with a new, they just came out with threads which is you know, going to be a pretty exciting product over the next several years, right? And they came up with that on a snap of fingers. This is the type of stuff they can do now. 
plus AI. I didn't even touch on AI. AI is going to help them massively when it comes to serving up ads, serving up content, Instagram reels. Take, take. I mean, I could go. I could speak about Meta for thirty minutes straight. There's so many things going for Meta. There's so many growth levers all over the place for this company over this next few years. It's easy money. Okay, absolutely love this stock. It's going to continue to be my biggest position in the public account for probably the next, uh, I would say, several years in, in there, okay? All right, you guys, next stock up here, number three of these five stocks to buy for 2024 is PayPal. Now, PayPal, this is a different one than many of these stocks where this one hasn't performed well, right? Stock's down 27%. And let me just put it like this. They are wrong. And I mean, every person that has been selling the stock, every Wall Street fund that has been selling the stock, it's wrong. How do I know they're wrong? Numbers, data, facts. That's what matters in this game, okay? What's the dumb numbers? What's the facts around this company? Those are non-gap numbers, which matter more than the gap numbers right now for the company because they have some one-time uh, kind of like freak expenses in relation to buy now, pay later, and that sell-off there, okay? So the non-gap numbers, 9% revenue growth, 8% operating income growth, 20% net income growth on a non-gap basis for this company. As far as their guidance went, all very healthy. 7 to 8% on an FX neutral basis. They're expecting for revenue growth. Extremely impressive EPS numbers. EPS that is, let's just call it, uh, growing much more rapidly than the uh, top lines growing, which is something I love to see in a company. I always love to see net income growing faster than your revenues, which is very similar to what's going on with Meta right now, right? And then, you know, one of the things I love about PayPal is and it reminds me so much of Meta because I'm not just buying one service. If I was only getting PayPal, I might not be as interested in the stock. But because I'm getting the PayPal brand, which is a massive worldwide brand, right? Then on top of that, I get Venmo. Then on top of that, I get Braintree, which is the back end service for a lot of companies and probably a lot more companies in the future running transactions. It's amazing, man. It's absolutely amazing. And PayPal and Venmo are just being accepted more and more places. Somebody in the private stock group sent me a, a photo, a DM, and uh, they were ordering on McDonald's. And right there on the app, it says, uh, you know, now you can pay with PayPal and Venmo uh, right through the McDonald's app. And it's just like, they just continue to expand, continue to become more and more relevant literally year after year after year after year. Now, on top of that, they got a new CEO from Intuit. And I got to say, I was shocked. The conference call was so freaking good. It was so freaking good. Um, I've never heard a new CEO have such a good conference call before. Everything that man said, I was cheering for. Everything that man said, I was like, this is exactly where I want PayPal to go. He's talking about a lean, efficient PayPal moving forward, a focused PayPal, you know, focus on their, their biggest strengths and making those strengths even stronger. And he's going to keep you know, expenses in line, I was just like, everything I listened to on that conference call, I was just like, well done, sir. Like, I, I'm so excited for him and, and what progress he's going to make with this company over time. And he, the, great, the great thing for him is he doesn't have to come into a fix a broken company. All he's got to come in and do is tweak a few things with the business model, but he's got to fix a broken stock. The company's phenomenal. The numbers show it, right? And these numbers, by the way, have nothing to do with him, like, the, you know, because he just started with the company. These are the old CEO's numbers, and they're still freaking good. And so he's just got to fix a broken stock. And there's a difference between a broken company and a broken stock. This is a broken stock, and it's about to be fixed in a massive way. Now, the valuation of this company is dirt cheap. It's below dirt cheap. Now, keep in mind, I think PayPal is going to come in and beat all these analyst expectations over this next couple of years. But even if the analyst expectations were correct, it's trading dirt cheap. I mean, 11 times this year's numbers, come on. Nine times next year's numbers, well, what is this, Wells Fargo? Like, come on. For a company with this sort of growth, this is silly. This is downright silly. Okay. When I look at PayPal and I see a company, where do I see the stock price going to? We're going back to two to $300. We will be over the next two to three years. We're going back there. That's where the stock used to be. It was a 200 or $300 stock and we're headed back there, folks. Um, keep in mind, the company is so much stronger than where we were several years ago when this was a 200 to $300 stock. And so that's where I believe we're going over the next few years. I believe the revenue is going to continue to increase. I believe there's a potential that we could see reacceleration of revenue as Alex Chris kind of changes the game in regards to innovation around this company. I think you're going to see net income outstrip revenue by quite a margin. And then on top of that, I will say this in terms of fintech in general, I believe my belief is all these fintech stocks have all hitting bottoms in the fourth quarter of this year that we're in right now. Right. And I believe they're going to play undertaker in 2024, which means they're going to come back to life. And I believe that's for the fintech industry in general in 2024. So that is my belief, folks. And uh, PayPal, love, love, love that one. All right, folks, next one up here, 
Stock number four of these five is Palantir. Oh, baby, is this one set up good. Now, let me address an elephant in the room right off the bat with Palantir. You see the stock price, 189% performance year to date, right? It's like, oh my gosh, the stock, it's already gone up so much. It can't go up anymore. It's maxed out. It's got to be overvalued, right? doesn't work like that, okay? Let me show you a two-year chart of Palantir. On a two-year chart of Palantir, this stock's down about 18 percentage points. So wait a minute. Two years, it's down about 18%. And keep in mind, the company's in a far stronger position than it was two years ago. I mean, it's like a night and day difference. Two years ago, they were still talking about huge stock-based compensation, huge losses on the company, a bunch of disasters all over the place, okay? And uh, now the company's so well set up, I'm like, it's, it's almost laughable that the stock is trading under where it was trading two years ago, okay? Very, very laughable. Now, if you played out the, the kind of timing game right, right, which I certainly did, you're up significantly on the stock. I'm already up $53,000, but I think it's a small amount from what I'll be up over time in regards to the stock. I just timed it out probably better than maybe some other folks did because I looked out there and I said, I like to buy a stock usually right before it's going to flip to profitability. And uh, so I started buying the stock about a quarter or two before they actually started to flip over to that profit side. And man, has it been treating me well? And I think it's going to be treating me a whole lot better in the future. Here's a deal. Okay. The company is about to have a reacceleration of revenue growth, which is one of the most exciting things for stock to ever have happen. It's already actually transpiring with the company, by the way. I mean, the revenue growth reached some pretty bad levels toward the end of last year, uh, beginning of this year. And now we're starting to see a reacceleration of revenue growth. I think the numbers are way too low that analysts have. Analysts had the company growing about 19.5% revenues 2024. I think it's way too low. Okay. It's really two parts. One part is the government side. They should have some massive government deals coming in in the international market and U.S. market. We're in a more dangerous world than we've certainly been in some time. And in a more dangerous and complicated world, Palantir is a product you need. Okay. Bottom line is, like Palantir's biggest strengths on the government side is not really peacetime. It's actually drama time, okay? And so that's a huge strength for Palantir over this next several years. Part number two is commercial needs Palantir more than ever. Every single company out there is trying to figure out how can I use my data much more efficiently, smarter, and how can I use artificial intelligence? And I told you guys for a year plus, Palantir is the cross sections of the data and artificial intelligence and having your business make much better decisions and saving you tremendous amounts of cost and saving you more money as a business than whatever you're spending on it, right? And so we have a fundamental change in the business model here where previously there was about a six month pilot. If you were to try to get a new commercial customer, so let's say Palantir wanted to go after company XYZ, okay? It was like a six month pilot for that company to really start to see results and try to figure out, okay, is Palantir a great product for us? Now through AIP, they're talking about they're doing these two day boot camps that their customers can see right off the bat the results their product can give. I mean, that's the holy grail. Carp on the conference call talked about he did he did some sort of boot camp. He said it took him six hours. Six hours. So we, we're talking about this is going from many months of a potential sales cycle to maybe potentially days or weeks. And that's a game changer for your business model, right? If it takes you that was one of the one of the only negative things you can say about Palantir in the past is their sales cycle so long. It takes them 6, 12, 18, 24 months to pull in a customer. Now we're talking about that customer can see results in a matter of days. That's a huge game changer for Palantir. Like an overnight game changer, okay? Now, I believe analysts have screwed up that. I believe analysts, which 17 analysts have numbers out there, they have them only doing 29 cents of EPS next year. I'm like, how? How are they only going to do 29 cents? We know they're going to likely still make a fortune from treasuries next year, Okay. That's basically in the bag. But this is a comp- this is a company at infant stage of profitability. And now they're flipping their operating side of their income in a massive way as well, right? And so I'm looking out there. I'm like, I don't think analysts understand how stocks work. I, I literally don't think they, they do because I love to track stocks that are on the, on you know, basically that just reach the infant stage of profitability, which is a Palantir. And what you usually see is insane EPS growth over the next several years coming out of that, okay? And I watched it with Tesla, I watched it with a thousand stocks over the past 15 years. And so I believe analysts are way too low. So the stock looks like, oh, it's very expensive. It's 62 times the expected 2024 numbers. And I'm looking out there, I'm like, you think they're only going to do 29 cents of EPS? You think they're only going to do 29 cents of EPS in 2024? Ah! No, 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 okay. This number right here is even too low. That number is too low. Even the highest analyst expectation is far too low for this company, Okay. Now, on top of that, here's the deal. They just launched a few months ago a big share repurchase. 
okay? A billion dollar uh, stock buyback plan, essentially, okay? Now, one is Palantir's got a fortress balance sheet so they can pull this off. Two, it's funny because, I mean, it's crazy how things can change over time, right? I mean, literally just a couple of years ago, all everybody talked about for the negative with Palantir was not only the long sales cycle, but stock-based compensation, right? And now, in a matter of a couple of years, how fast things have flipped, where now we're talking about taking shares off the market with a massive billion-dollar buyback or so, right? I mean, what a change. What a change in a matter of just two or three years. And so you got to think, what if, if Palantir has made this much progress in their business model just in just the past two years, how much progress are they going to make over the next two years when their products are perfectly positioned, right? Now, S&P 500 inclusion. Okay, let's talk about this. This is something that is likely going to happen for the company. And when is it going to happen for the company? It's likely going to happen in 2024. Okay. I don't know what quarter will have to happen. And that's a huge moment because once it's announced that they're going to get an SP 500, usually you see a big, you know, kind of run up for the stock because a lot of people buy and knowing that a bunch of funds are going to be forced to buy Palantir. In Palantir, the more the market cap goes up into that inclusion, the more potentially these funds and ETFs and folks will have to buy Palantir. Uh, because it's going to be a bigger and bigger weight when it goes in. So, you know, that's going to be a pretty extraordinary situation. And like I said, I think there's a, you know, it's no guarantees, but I think it's a pretty high probability that in 2024, S&P 500 inclusion happens. Okay. Now, next part is in the private stock group, we have a tremendous amount of Palantir shareholders in there, but also Palantir folks that have used a product over time, either on the military side, government side, commercial side. Okay. I haven't heard anybody speak bad about Palantir's products. Everybody I've heard it says, this product's next level, man. This is the best of the best. This is a creme de la creme. There's nothing above this product, okay? So that's phenomenal because I don't experience the product on a day-to-day basis. So I got to count on other people that use this product and have used this product and what they say, okay? And the, I, like I said, I never hear anybody speak bad about the product. The second component is the team, the team, the team in regards to Palantir. From what I've heard, Palantir is one of the hardest companies you can possibly imagine. We got a lot of different software engineers and engineers in general inside the private stock group. And I, what I've heard from those folks is they say, trying to get into Palantir, good luck. You can get into Google, Meta, companies like that before you can get into Palantir. So the, 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 the folks are the highest of the highest level that are working over there at Palantir, okay? And those type of folks, they want to work for a carp. They just do. Um, they just do. And so that's phenomenal as well. So when do I sell Palantir? Okay. Cause the stocks were already up 109% of the stock. When do I sell the stock? I will say this. When do I sell the stock? Uh, no time soon. <laughs> no time soon. When I look at Palantir, the company's at infant stage of profitability, they're going to expand the profitability in an epic way over the coming years. I know these sorts of business models, these sorts of business models become the biggest cash cows of the cash cows. These are sorts of business models that over a five, tier, 10 year span, everybody ends up wanting to own because they become such cash cows and they're so predictable with their business, right? Because I think their product's going to be extremely sticky. And if you're a government entity and you start using Palantir, I think you're going to continue to use Palantir for potentially decades to go in the future. I think the same thing on the commercial side. You sign a three-year deal with Palantir. I think you're going to sign another three, five, seven, 10-year deal after that deal, okay? And so these are this is almost like the holy grail of business models. And so... I don't know when I sell Palantir. I just tell you it's no time soon. No time soon. Do I ever sell Palantir? I don't know. Maybe someday. But I just it's so far away from me even being interested in selling the stock. It's not even funny, folks. Okay. That was stock number four or five. Already the last one up here. Last one to buy for 2024. It's not a stock. Okay. It's actually an ETF. And it is the Russell, the IWM. Okay. The IWM is absolutely a buy for 2024 and beyond. We're going through a phenomenal... like a very strange time period. Okay. And this is insanely rare. This is a three-year chart of the uh, Russell. Okay. It's down. It's down 5% in the past three years. Now, if you look back at the past, you know, 50 years of the market, you're going to find very few times that the Russell was ever down on a three-year basis. Extremely, extremely rare. But that's what's going on. We're lower right now than we were, at, you know, during periods of November of 2020. Let that sink in for a moment when we had Rona going on, right? On top of that, these stocks are trading dirt cheap right now. I mean, absolutely dirt cheap. If you look at the past 25 years of the stock market, the Russell recently has been trading about as cheap as you'll ever find it. It's not going to stay like that forever. And so the IWM is a buy, okay? 
I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. I appreciate you joining me. I hope you appreciate this video here today. And also, make sure you sign up for our Black Friday deal. We'll send that over to you. It's a one-day seal on Black Friday. The way to get access to that is by entering your info, and we'll send you it over either via text or via email when it drops on Black Friday. 62 bucks. It's a no-brainer. I don't care if you got you know a few thousand bucks in your account or you got a multi-million dollar portfolio. That should tr help you out tremendously. You get access to the full Becoming Master Stock Market course, which is a $997 course in itself. It's my number one stock market course ever. Ability to see the stocks I'm buying and selling through that Fidelity account. And you get to learn how I diversify a portfolio. Oh, plus you get access to Discord chat as well. I forgot to mention that um, for that particular group. So appreciate you guys joining me as always. Much love. Thanks so much for being here and have a great day.